Hello and welcome to uh, section 4.3. Uh, so this is video number one of, of this section. Um, we're just going to kind of continue the trend with uh, these sort of more abstract ve vector spaces that we've been introducing um, of uh, redefining some of the... Um, actually, we're gonna very much going to continue the trend of what we've been doing because we're going to uh, redefine something, show how it holds for other vector spaces. We'll look at um, uh, sort of our favorite example thus far of polynomials. And then we're going to go right back to Rn in the end. Um, <laughs> so kind of the trend of linear algebra, I guess. Uh, but anyways, we say that a set of vectors, and so remember now we're allowing these vectors to be in any sort of a vector space. And so this is the main reason we actually do need to redefine some of this is just to sort of verify and sort of confirm that in fact all of these ideas that hold in Rn also hold in other vector spaces. So a set of vectors is linearly independent if this vector equation here um, where again we've got c1 v1 plus dot 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 cp vp uh, equals zero has only the trivial solution of c1 equals all the way up to cp equals zero and if, if they are not linearly independent, then we say the vectors are linearly dependent. Uh, so this definition should look actually exactly the same, of course, as the original definition of linearly independent that we gave. Um, again, here we're just allowing our vectors to be potentially more than ordered lists of numbers. Um, and so we actually call this, I, I don't know how much we'll actually see this definition, but I think it's important uh, to state. If there is some non-zero solution to this equation, and remember here, non-zero solution doesn't mean that all of the constants here are non-zero, just at least uh, a few of them. Uh, then we call this a linear dependence relation. So linearly independent, linearly dependent, it turns out we can define the exact same way that we did before. Um, so set of vectors is linearly dependent. Again, in a sense, if they're sort of, well, independent of one another, right? You can't you can't use some subset of the vectors to get to another vector in the set, that they're all sort of presenting you with new information. So um, we've got this theorem, which I wanted to talk about and then go over actually an example um, to specify, I think, what is a really important distinction about linearly ind linear independence. But uh, so what this theorem says is that if we've got a set, again, of P vectors, and here we're going to specify that v1 is not equal to zero, just to specify again that, um, right, because a lot of this kind of starts to get uh, trivial when we've got a zero vector in it. Remember, um, you know, a set of vectors containing the zero vector is just always linearly dependent because we can assign any non-zero constant to the zero vector and get a dependence relation. Um, so that's sort of why we specify that v1 has to be non-zero. And so we say that this set is linearly dependent if and only if there is some vj. And so this is important because um, this is saying there is at least some vector v sub j for j bigger than 1, such that v sub j is a linear combination of the previous j minus 1 vectors. Um, so why is this theorem important? Because this theorem states that, again, we can find some vector that is a linear combination of the others. Uh, the important distinction here, uh, notice that this sum is not an all, right? So if a set of vectors is linearly dependent, that does not mean that all vectors are a linear combination of other vectors. It just means that I can find some vector that is a linear combination of the others. Um, and so I wanted to sort of verify that with one example. Um, and again, we'll look at the classic example now of polynomials. So we'll say consider the vector space P2. Where again, P2 is just our set of or I guess our vector space now, of um, polynomials of degree at most 2.
And so I'm going to define three polynomials. So we'll let p1 of x equal 4x, p2 of x equal negative 12x, and p3 of x equal x squared minus 1. So some facts about this. Notice that the set p1 of x, p2 of x, p3 of x is linearly dependent. And so the reason being is that notice I can write um, p2 of x, right, as a linear combination of p1 of x, right? That is, there's some constant that when multiplied by p1 gives me p2. And so this, along with theorem 4 here, is enough to show that this set is linearly dependent. But the important fact here is that p3 of x actually cannot be written as a linear combination of p1 of x and p2 of x. And so the reason for this is that p3 of x has an x squared term here. And so if you notice, again, linear combinations were only allowed to multiply by um, scalars, right? So I can't increase my the degree of my polynomial by multiplying by a scalar. And so two degree one polynomials is never going to be enough to get me to a degree two polynomial. And so uh, it's sort of an important distinction here again that um, this word sum in the theorem for that it's not that every single polynomial in this set is going to be written as a linear combination of the others. It's just that I can find some sort of subset that will give me this linear dependence relation. Um, and of course, you know, if I if I were to sum all of these up, you know, I could still get a non-trivial solution to the um, homogeneous equation, right? So I could sum all these up. You know, I could write three times p one of x plus p two of x plus zero times p three of x, right? And this would still equal the zero polynomial. So I guess I can just write that as zero. Um, in this sense, it's the zero vector, right? But it's the zero polynomial. Um, and notice this would still be a non-trivial solution, even though one of the constants is zero. And that's okay, right? We just need some of the constants to be non-zero. All right, so that kind of wraps it up with the review slash redefining of new term or old terms. So now we get to define some new terms. So we now have enough um, built up that we can define this, which will be one of the most referenced definitions now, I think, for the rest of the course. So we're going to say let h be a subspace of a vector space v. Then a set of vectors b equals v1 up through vp is a basis for h if we have two things. One, the span of this set of vectors is equal to h, and two, this set of vectors is linearly independent. So we will look at this definition quite a bit, independent, sorry, 
tried to talk while I was spelling, which apparently I'm not 100% capable of doing. Um, so we will talk about this definition and some reasoning behind it uh, more as the course goes on, but I wanted to at least now give a little bit of reasoning as to why. So why do we choose the word basis? What are we trying to achieve with a basis? Um, so remember one. So if the span of this set of vectors is equal to h, this means every vector in h Uh, can be written as a linear combination, and I'll just say abbreviated linear combo for now, of this set of vectors. So this number one sort of in a sense means that like this set of vectors, if I, if I just have this smaller set of vectors, right? And we'll see sometimes, you know, we can get bases for uh, vector spaces that are themselves infinite with a small number of vectors. This set of vectors in a sense can get me to all of H, right? So like we kind of say it's a basis for H um, because like this set of vectors alone is enough to describe all of H in some sense. This set of vectors being linearly independent, well, this means that if I remove one, then the span will not equal h. And so number two, in sort of a rough sense, tells us not only that this is a set that can get us to everything in H, it also in a sense tells us that this is like sort of a smallest set that can get me to everything in H, right? Because this set being linearly independent means that one of these vectors, right? Like none of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of the others. And so, you know, what that means is if I were to remove one, well, then the span will not equal h, and so in a sense, it's lost the sort of defining trait of being able to describe every vector in h. Um, and so we'll talk more about each of these sort of, I guess, reasoning, but you can think of like a basis, and it might make more sense when we look at an example, as being like sort of this minimum sized set that can be used to describe the whole vector space. Um, and so I do want to look at one example, but first I want to point out something that, um, you know, interestingly, I, I don't think the book points it out until this point either. Um, note that uh, a vector space V is always a subspace of itself. Meaning that, like, certainly, you know, V is always a subset of itself, right? The only defining quality of a subset is that you're contained in some set, and certainly V, the set, is contained in itself. Um, and then if you look at all of the defining qualities of subspace, uh, V definitely satisfies all of those qualities. And so um, it seems like sort of a trivial thing to point out, I guess, but just given the definition of basis, like we also are going to be trying to find bases for larger vector spaces. Um, so I don't want to sort of confuse, like, you know, this definition holds for all vector spaces, um, not just subspaces, I guess is sort of the point of this note. So one example, we've seen bases before, um, the set, one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one is a basis for R three. Um, and so if you'll remember, these are the we actually I I think I might have given them the name, the standard basis vectors. 
but we called these E1, E2, and E3. And so you can kind of see why this would be a basis for R3, and I think this also gives a description for like the meaning behind these definitions. So certainly all of these are linearly independent, right, because of where the one, sort of the entry the one pops up in, right, that like, because this is the only vector with a one in the first position, of course this can't be written as a linear combination of these two, because these zeros can never turn into ones. Um, and then if you'll remember, uh, actually from looking at kind of our linear transformation um, knowledge, each of these vectors um, is enough to give me any vector in R3, right? If I just put the correct weights on E1, E2, and E3, then of course the span of these three vectors is equal to R3. And so this is the basis, in fact, called the standard basis for R3. And so moving forward from that, we can actually, um, we actually have a standard basis for Rn. And so we say that the set E1 through En is called the standard basis for Rn. Um, and so again, what this is is just um, each vector is a basically the ith um, entry of the n by n identity matrix, right? So this would be the vector of length n with a one in the first position. This would be the vector of length n with a one in the nth position. Um, and so for all dimensions, uh, r1 through rn, this always gives me a basis um, of rn. So um, let's see. Where are we at? Ah, so we've seen Rn. What about our other favorite vector space now? The polynomials of degree two. Can you find a basis for the set of polynomials of degree two? Um, so think about it. I think this is a good problem to sort of try, um, try working out uh, the details on this. So I'd actually encourage you to pause the video here. Um, try to work this out on your own. There's many correct answers actually. Um, and then I will uh, present the answer. So pause the video. Try to find a basis for P2 and kind of convince yourself it's a basis, uh, and then I'll go over it. All right, so a basis for P2. So remember that every element in P2 can be written in the following way. Right, where here we've got um, AX squared plus BX plus C. And so if I want a basis for P2, I want a set of uh, polynomials, all of which are linearly independent, right? And we kind of already saw like a good way to, to measure linearly independent is, you know, if we have different degree terms in those polynomials. Um, and we need, again, a set of polynomials, which could get me to every single polynomial in P2. So a good guess would be the following three polynomials. We'll say p of 0 is equal to 1, p1 of x is equal to x, and p2 of x is equal to x squared. And so notice these are linearly independent. And every polynomial, where here a, b, and c are just arbitrary constants, can be written as a linear combination of these three polynomials. So a basis for the polynomials of degree two would be 
the polynomial 1, the polynomial x, and the polynomial of x squared. Basically just sort of clicking up the degree with each single term polynomial. Um, and so looking at sort of, right, we, we know that like certainly we can have vector spaces of polynomials of other degrees. Um, this would actually be sort of then a good way to find a basis for all of those uh, resulting vector spaces of all degrees. Um, so that is uh, bases, or sort of a, a short introduction to bases. Um, so next video, we will start off by looking at uh, bases of Rn, um, where we kind of, we have actually already built up the, the tools needed to find bases of Rn. Um, we'll just sort of collect them, go over it, and actually come up with a nice process to determine if a set of vectors forms a basis for Rn. So like I said, we're kind of going to jump back to Rn, uh, and then we'll kind of continue to look at more uh, results and theorems related to bases, which like I said, is going to be you know, finding bases and talking about bases will be one of the biggest topics moving forward.